good evening everybody welcome to this evening episode of pursue this is pursue 4b and this is guiding path and we are streaming live from kolkata and today we have with us colonel tanushree mukherjee she is an mbbs md from uh, she is she is an md from armed force medical college pune and she is also done the dnb mnms she is a professor in the department of pathology command hospital kolkata she is trained in oncopathology and she is an affiliate member of the royal college of pathologists today she will be talking about the neoplastic and non neoplastic lesions of cervix but before we start uh, please uh, let me request you to keep your mic muted your camera off and please don't share your screen and when you join please press join now and don't press present with this let me request uh, kanal mukherjee to start her lecture ma'am please share your screen and start your lecture thank you so much yeah we can see your screen just make it full screen please yes good evening yeah. so today's lecture will be on cervix the non neoplastic and the neoplastic lesions the specimen handling grossing i c and the update so the topic will be covered with keeping in view to write your full answer of the cervix theory paper like the anatomy and development hpv virus because it has got very important implication the benign lesions the cervical squamous intraepithelial lesions squamous cell carcinoma the endocervical adenocarcinoma in situ cervical glandular intraepithelial neoplasia and adenocarcinoma of the usual type and the non hpv related and the mesenchymal and mixed epithelial mesenchymal neoplasm and other cervical neoplasm so benign lesions they are important why because you have to differentiate it from the neoplastic because as you will see further there so many entities and there is so much overlap so you have to be very very careful so these are all the entities which are covered under the benign lesions cervix cervix term is taken from latin meaning neck is the most inferior portion of the uterus protruding into the upper vagina cervix measures 2.5 to 3 cm in length in the adult nulli gravida the external arc is circular in the nulli gravida and flat like in the pagus the blood supply of the cervix is provided by the descending branches of the uterine artery development The majority of the mammalian female reproductive tract develops in the mullerian duct, which form as invagination of the lumbic epithelium into the urogenital region, mesenchyme, through which they grow cordy. Histology. The cytology I will be taking later when I take the Bethesda classification. Here I will just mention the cell type. The mature non-keratinized squamous epithelium of the exocervix is similar to the vaginal epithelium. It is divided into three zones: the basal, parabasal, or the germinal cell layer, which is responsible for continuous epithelial renewal; the stratum spinosum, the dominant portion of the epithelium; and the superficial zone containing the most mature cell population. So there are the basal cells, which act as the reserve cells, and the parabasal cells. Here you can see the cytology. I have first the superficial cells, then the intermediate cells, and there are the parabasal cells, and there are the endocervical cells. The parabasal cells typically form a layer that is one to two cells thick over the basal layer. In the normal condition, the basal layer acts as a reserve cell layer, and mitosis are only identified in parabasal cells. In the lower photomicrograph, you can see the atrophic squamous epithelium, 
which is devoid of glycogen rich speculated cells. This is the comparison between the normal squamous epithelium and the atrophic squamous epithelium. Then the endocervical mucosa, as you can see, and sometimes you can see lymphoid follicles, as you see in the fourth photograph in the cervical stroma. Then the transformation zone, which is very important, it is histologically characterized by the presence of metaplastic epithelium. It is the region between the original squamocolumnar junction and the post pubertal functional squamocolumnar junction. The concept is extremely important because the pathogenesis of squamous cell carcinomas of cervix and its precursors, it all starts here. In older and postmenopausal women, the functional squamocolumnar junction is nearly always located within the external organ. Then there is effects of estrogen and progesterone, which is cyclic, and the secretions they change with the cycles, and then there can be Langerhans cells and lymphoiderized cells because the immunity, the mucosal immunity, is an important component of the host defense mechanism against viral and bacterial pathogens. The IHC of the normal cervical tissues. Here I will stress on the importance of P16, which shows block positivity in cases of famous intraepithelial lesion. So the tumor of the uterine surface, it mentions all the benign as well as the malignant lesion. So if the numbers are many, but I will try to touch upon most of them. Then there is a pre decidual reaction and the area of cellar reaction. Pre decidual, pro decidual reaction of the stroma, either patchy or diffuse, as shown in the upper photomicrograph, it disappears by two months postpartum. The lower photomicrograph shows the area of cellar reaction of the endocervix. During pregnancy, the gestational area of cellar reaction can develop in both endocervical glands and ectopic endometrial gland within the cervix. And it can look very much aggressive and you can confuse it with adenocarcinoma in C. The squamous metaplasia is replacement of the mucin producing columnar epithelium by stratified squamous epithelium. It can be mature, immature or atypical and there are two mechanisms by which there is famous metaplasia. One mechanism that is direct ingrowth from the native partial epithelium bordering the columnar epithelium, which is known as famous epithelization. And second mechanism involves the proliferation of undifferentiated some columnar dissolved cells of the intercervical epithelium, which differentiate into famous epithelium. Then there can be tubal metaplasia and tubo endometrioid metaplasia of the surface. Tubal metaplasia can be quite extensive and can occasionally be mistaken for endocervical glandular neoplasia. But the cytological features of gland is lack of mitosis and prominent cilia is seen at the apical surface of tubal metaplasia. Then there can be reactive ATPR, like famous reparative ATPR in the first photograph. Then there is reparative changes developing in immature metaplastic squamous epithelium. The third micro photograph shows endocervical reparative ATPR, and fourth is the papillary endocervical reparative change. Enemy, which is sometimes called as the papillary endocervicitis. But here I mentioned it that it is called as papillary endocervical degenerative change. And there is marked inflammation of the stroke. Then there can be hyperkeratosis of the cervix and parakeratosis as seen in the lower uh, photograph. The spignotic nuclei are retained in the superficial cell there. And both can be accompanied also. 
an infectious cervicitis, the causes are many. It could be chlamydia, nizaria, mycoplasma, viruses, HPV, fungi, candida, aspergillus, and protozoa. Condylama acuminata, I mentioned here because of the infection, but later on I will cover it with the low grade squamous intraepithelial lesion. It is L cell CIN1 condylometrous variant. It looks like a genital bot on the mucosal surface. Then the pseudoneoplastic glandular condition, hyperplasia and endometriosis. Here we have to differentiate it. There can be microglandular endocervical hyperplasia. This is a benign proliferation of endocervical gland. Incidental finding on a cervical biopsy, cone biopsy, or a hysterectomy specimen. It may resemble a cervical polyp. Patient may complain of post the bleeding. It may present in a single focus or in multiple foci. There is an adenomatous pattern here with tubercle lining cells and focal squamous metaphase. Then there may be lobular endocervical glandular hyperplasia. It is a rare form and it can be sometimes found only with a distinctive gastric phenotype. It is pyloric gland metaplasia and a special IHC is there that is HIK1083 which is specific for gastric pyloric mucin. Then there is lobular endocervical glandular hyperplasia, which is confined to the inner one half of the cervical wall, and the gland lining cells are devoid of malignant atypia, and mitosis do not exceed 2 per 10 high power C. And here you have to differentiate this from the gastric type of adenocarcinoma, like adenoma malignum, minimal deviation adenocarcinoma. So this is a diffuse laminar endocervical glandular hyperplasia, endocervical glandular hyperplasia, then some mesonephric remnants and floric mesonephric hyperplasia. These are all the benign lesions, but it has to be carefully seen and differentiated from the neoplastic lesion. Then terminal cluster, which can be found incidentally in cone biopsy, from stichomy, it could be type A or type B. These are lobular aggregates of benign endocervical glands in the cervical wall. Type A are composed of small non cystic glands, and type B are composed of cystically dilated glands. This is having excellent prognosis and no risk of recurrence of malignant transformation and particularly is asymptomatic. So, microscopically, as I said, it could be type A and type B or Sometimes it can be of mixed pattern. They have got no clinical relevance and do not need to be mentioned in the pathology report. The differential diagnosis, but they are minimal deviation adenocarcinoma, the usual type endocervical adenocarcinoma, adenocarcinoma in situ, nevotial cyst, or mesonephric nephrin or hyperplasia. Then endocervicosis of the cervix and endometriosis of the cervix. These are all conditions which can be encountered. Then the polypoid lesions of the cervix, either they could be polyp or a microglandular endocervical hyperplasia, decidua, granulation tissue, a leomyoma, a fibroadenoma, squamous papilloma, condyloma acuminatum, papillary adenofibroma, squamous cell carcinoma, adenocarcinoma, or a sarcoma. Mesodermal stromal polyp, or a placental site trophoblastic nodule can also encounter. Then papillary adenofibroma of the endocervix and molarian papilloma which show papillary projection. Now I come to the precursor of the squamous cell carcinoma with the limit about the human epidermal viruses. The cervical cytology and all I will not cover in this lecture. That will be in the subsequent lecture, the Bethesda system. The squamous cell precursors, it has been agreed upon that it should be classified as a two tier classification low and high grade intraepithelial lesion because it is more biologically relevant 
and histologically more reproducible. Then the three tires, CIN1, CIN2, and CIN3 terminology. Approximately one third of low grade squamous intraepithelial lesions show diffuse so called block positive P16 immunostaining involving the basal and parabasal cell layer. So, this low grade corresponds to CIN1. And the high grade corresponds to CIN2 and CIN3. About HPV and their mechanism of action, they are the epitheliotropic viruses with double stranded DNA genomes, eight coding genes defined as early or late, depending on when they are expressed. 200 HPVs have been identified. The main mechanism of action is reduction of intracellular. Availability of the host cell cycle inhibitor oncosuppressor protein specifically and etinoblastoma. E7 proteins bind and inactivate the etinoblastoma protein. E6 proteins bind P53 and direct its rapid degradation. Mutation of P53 is a rare phenomenon seen in high grade cells and in HPV positive invasive cervical pathways. It's better we say high grade cells. SIL, squamous intraepithelial lesion. Then how do you define cholocytosis? Very important thing, very basic, but everybody should know that the marked variation in the nucleoside, that is three times, dark chromatin, irregular resonoid nuclear membrane. For the low-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion, it could present as the exophytic condyloma in a variusiform growth pattern. These are caused by HPV type 6 and 11. And these are rare conditions. Immature condyloma and flat condyloma. HPV 16 and HPV 18 produce more rapidly growing and larger lesions. Coilocytosis is really most prominent in the upper third of the epithelium. The surface cells may exhibit Parakeratosis or hyperkeratosis with bi or multinucleation. L cells must be distinguished from mimics of L cells due to a variety of infectious or inflammatory processes that are unrelated to HPV infection. This I have shown earlier the condylometer variant of low grade squamous epithelial lesions. Then high grade squamous intraepithelial lesions which corresponds to SYN2 and SYN3, nuclear ATPI in all levels of the epithelium with variable degree of surface maturation. P16 being strongly expressed. In acetovite, colposcopic appearance, you see a acetovite well circumscribed lesion on the external os and the lower photomicrograph shows X cell with metaplastic features with P16 staining, strong diffuse positivity. And the other end photograph, the HE and the IHC shows stratified mucin producing intraepithelial lesion, mild. This X cell shows both mucinous and squamous differentiation with high KI67 labeling index and stays positively for P16. And the therapy is conservative, just cryosurgery, laser ablation, or a loop electrosurgical excision procedure. The variants of XL, it could be keratinizing XL or a papillary squamous carcinoma in situ, or a non invasive papillary squamous transitional carcinoma. High risk HPVs are found in over 90% of cervical high grade squamous intraepithelial lesions. Biologically, HP can be thought of a clonal expansion of cells that derives to proliferate by the abnormal expression of HPV E6 and HPV E7 in cells still capable of cell division. This is a table which shows the dis distinguishing features of 
low grade and high grade squamous intraepithelial lesion. HPV type 16 and 18, high risk type with SL. Coelocytosis present in low grade squamous epithelial lesion. Ploidy mostly deployed or polyploid in low grade squamous intraepithelial lesion. Abnormal mitotic figures are frequent in SL. Location of differentiated cells and mitotic figures seen in lower third in low grade squamous intraepithelial lesion and in upper two thirds in XL. So, what you see here in XL, there is presence of nuclear achipia with increased mitotic index with mitosis in the upper half of the epithelium, loss of cell polarity, abnormal mitotic figures and markedly atypical and bizarre cells. These are the photomicrographs showing X cell with how to differentiate from the immature squamous metaplasia with abnormal parakeratosis. Another entity is a superficially invasive squamous cell carcinoma or the early stage invasive squamous cell carcinoma is defined by less than or equal to 3 millimeters invasion in depth by 7 millimeter in, in length without capillary lymphatic space invasion and patients are amenable to conservative excision so this is very important and margins are of vital importance. As for the FIGO, we have seen here the staging here T1A this is stromal invasion 3 millimeter or less in depth and 7 millimeter or less in horizontal spread. So the measurement of the depth, the surgical margin is important because therapy is more conservative than that for stage 1A2. And treatment is often individualized based on the definition of the lesion, the lateral extent, and the factors. Now, Famous cell carcinoma and variant. It's an invasive epithelial tumor composed of neoplastic cells with varying degrees of squamous differentiation. It's the most common type of cervical carcinoma. Nearly all cases are associated with high risk HPV, predominantly with more HPV 16, more common in low resource countries. Fourth most common type of cancer and cause of cancer mortality, most patients are 40 to 54 years old. Sites arise at the squamous columnar junction of the cervix. Most infections with HPV spontaneously regress, but it progresses. As I told earlier, the mechanism of high HPV-induced carcinogenesis takes place. Adenoblastoma inactivation leads to overexpression of P16, a tumor suppressor gene involved in cell cycle regulation by inhibiting cyclin dependent kinases. So, we are by IHC using P16 as a surrogate marker for high risk HPV. And then there are vaccines for this, which is recommended is three doses for adolescents and adults of any gender aged 15 to 26 years. Etiology, younger age, immunodeficiency, smoking, multiparity, early age at first birth, chronic inflammation, positive family history, this, are, this can all be the causal clinical features, cervical mass, general bleeding, pain, post cortical bleeding, prognostic factors are tumor state, patient age, depth of invasion, disease volume, lymphovascular invasion, Better prognosis for lymphoepithelial and viruses variant. Worse prognosis with lower CD4 counts in HIV zero positive patients. This is the FIGO staging of the cervix uteri, and this is the growth which we see stage one confined to the cervix. Stage three, which involves the lower part of the vagina or extends the pelvic wall, and stage four, the carcinoma has extended beyond the true pelvis. So this is stage one, this is the stage two, this is 
stage three and this is stage four. Microscopically, tumor cells infiltrate as irregular anastomosing nests of single cells. Lymphovascular invasion may be present. There is mutations in PI, K3, PA most frequently. Low frequency of KRAS mutations. T P fifty three mutations in fifteen percent of cases with loss of heterozygosity in multiple lymphocytes. The histologically type has invasive carcinoma into keratinizing and non keratinizing. W H O has now kept small cell undifferentiated carcinoma with neuroendocrine features as a separate category. So for the keratinizing carcinoma, you have to have keratin pulse which are composed of clusters of squamous cells. That have undergone keratinization and arranged in a concentric nest. The variants could be this keratinizing, non-keratinizing, warty, chromotransitional, lymphoepithelial-like, pendant. Gradings it could be well differentiated, grade one, moderately differentiated, and poorly differentiated when Who can't recognize keratinization and will have to respond to IC. Clear cut squamous differentiation manifested by keratinization may be difficult to find in poorly differentiated squamous cell carcinoma. Prognostic features: stage is the most important prognostic factor. Histologic typing and grading have little direct influence. Tumor size, depth of invasion, parametral involvement, and nodal status are important. Three basic modalities for squamous cell carcinoma: surgery, radiation, and combination of radiation and surgery. And I will subsequently tell about the specimens for therapy. Then we will talk about squamous cell carcinoma. A radical variant, which is very rare. Dual endoscopic form of squamous cell carcinoma and a papillary variant with thin or dark papillae with fibrovascular pores lined by multilayered epithelium with squamous differentiation resembling high-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion. IHC, you can see pancytokeratin, CK56, EMA, P63, P40, P16 diffuse block-like staining, TDL1 positive in one percent of cases. And CK7, PAXA, GATA3 can come forward. Differential diagnosis could be clear cell carcinoma. Depending upon the type, it could be adenoid basal, adenoid cystic, small cell neuroendocrine. So differential diagnosis are too many. So how do I section the tumor? For hysterectomy, the position of the tumor in the cervix should be recorded. We have to see we have to receive the cone biopsy. Or a large loop excision of the transformation zone, or leaf procedure. You have to do a serial slicing from one edge to the other in a sagittal and parasagittal plane, perpendicular to the transverse axis, or in a full cone excision biopsy, serial wedge-shaped slices according to the hours on the clock face, and it should be submitted in entirety. The tumor involvement of the parametral and paracervical tissue should be noted, and it may determine the method of dissection and block taking. The paracervical tissue may need to be inked. It can be examined microscopically along with the main tumor section. And maximum tumor thickness invasion into the cervical stroma is also very important. Parametral involvement is a poor prognostic indicator for early stage cervical carcinoma, regardless of lymph node status, and is an adverse prognostic indicator for advanced stage cervical carcinoma. Treatments could be simple hysterectomy or tracheostomy, then radical tracheostomy, or a radical hysterectomy. Today, now it is not the standard treatment. Especially in the first-world countries, develop, in developing countries, still we receive a vada and cystectomy. But in developed nation, with a proper uh, screening program, this is not too much frequent. 
where the every parametria vaginic of pelvic paraiotic lymph node dissection with the uterus cervix everything is excised so when we receive that in your vagina you have to make a report like this in which you mention the cervical adventitial margin the various vaginal cut margin then uh, ovary parametrium and the histological report also mention all the so some question for find which of the following statement is true regarding femoral cell carcinoma of the cervix most are associated with high risk hpv and arise from a precursor lesion axis and more significant risk factor include persistent high risk hpv infection hpv 16 history of axis multiple sexual partners multiparity smoking and immunodeficiency then the glandular tumors and precursors which includes adenocarcinoma in situ the intraepithelial lesion containing malignant appearing glandular epithelium that carries a significant risk of invasive adenocarcinoma is not treated typically occurs in young women in their reproductive years with an average age at presentation of 38 years pap examination has low with the incomplete sampling of the endoservice as well as inherent difficulty in distinguishing benign from neoplastic glandular epithelium in pathologic presentation adenocarcinoma in situ almost always arises at the spermocolonia junction transformation zone and in 30 to 50% of cases adenocarcinoma in situ is associated with a squamous intraepithelial lesion which can be low or high grade then histologically what we see here normal cervical glandular architecture is preserved the glands being lined by crowded cells in large hyperchromatic stratified or pseudo stratified nuclei abrupt transition from normal to neoplastic epithelium then there is a early form of conventional adenocarcinoma in situ is recognized it is an early form of disease because it occurs in a younger age group it involves the superficial aspects of the cervical mucosa and it has less pronounced atypium similar to conventional adenocarcinoma in situ this variant is associated with high risk hpv and thus is also strongly positive for the biomarker p16 as shown in this photomicrogram clinical diagnosis of adenocarcinoma in situ could be due to a tubal or tubular endometrial metaplasia endometriosis areopsinal reaction radiation effect or cervical but we see here the look what we see here is the nuclear stratification hyperchromasia nuclear enlargement which is present mitosis is present apoptosis is present it may have a complex architecture and the mid one or the ki67 labeling is high then adenocarcinoma not otherwise specified 10 to 25 percent of all cervical carcinomas. This increase has led to decline, decline in squamous carcinoma secondary to screening programs and better identification of glandular lesions in cervical cytology samples. These are also associated with high risk HPV, most commonly types 18, 16, and 45. Clinical features are abnormal uterine bleeding and a mass lesion and What we see here in vitro pathology, common glands with pseudo architectural atypia that infiltrate the cervical stroma. A surface component of papillary architecture may also be prominent. Then there is endocervical adenocarcinoma of usual type, most common form of endocervical adenocarcinoma with relative using depletion. The usual type of endocervical adenocarcinoma constitutes about 90% of adenocarcinoma of the cervix. Large pools of mucin may occasionally be present in the stroma. Then the mucinous carcinoma, not otherwise specified, which is shown in the upper microbiograph, 
and the lone of micro photograph shows the lucinous carcinoma pigment ring cell type a rare adenocarcinoma that shows focal or diffuse pigment ring cell differentiation then here we are seeing the minimal deviation adenoma malignum now what i see here in the who is the new category of endocervical adenocarcinoma gastric subtype extremely well differentiated are called as adenoma malignum which is rare 1 to 2% not associated with hpv occurs in the reproductive age group associated with two zygote syndrome and the stk11 gene is involved deeply infiltrative irregular glands with bulbous protrusion i see positive it seven pap seed cdx2 HIK1083, MUC6, PEA, CK20, and neuroendocrine markers may be positive, and is loss of PAC2. Then below glandular carcinoma, this is a very variant of endocervical adenocarcinoma with distinct exophytic villus papillary growth. Typically occurs in the younger age population. It presents as an exophytic mass. Mitotic figures and pseudo fetification are present, and the villus fronds are characteristic. This tumor has a distinctive cellular fibrous stroma with prominent spindle components. HPV type 16, 18, or 45 are the main causative genotype identified. When superficially invasive, this variant is only rarely exhibited in so metastasis and has an excellent prognosis. Conservative management has been suggested as appropriate only in superficial lesions of pure below glandular morphology without high grade atypic and with no lymphovascular invasion. Then there is the endometrioid carcinoma, an adenocarcinoma arising in the cervix that has endometrioid morphological features. They are similar to usual type endocervical adenocarcinoma. They are morphologically similar to the endometrioid adenocarcinomas arising in the uterine corpus, and the differential diagnosis is with endometrial adenocarcinomas of endometrioid type extending from the uterine corpus. They are typically diffusely and strongly p16 positive, in contrast to tumors of endometrial origin, which most often have a patchy pattern of p16 expression. Then. Clear cell carcinoma, which is seen in the upper micro photograph, clear or oblate cells whose architectural patterns are solid, tubular cystic, or papillary. They are rare and have arisen in the population associated with hormone exposure. And serous carcinoma, as seen in the lower micro photograph, rare adenocarcinoma of the cervix. its logical appearance to endometrial or adnexal serous carcinoma it is an aggressive tumor with poor prognosis associated with older age higher stage tumors greater than 2 cm invasion greater than 1 cm lymph node metastasis and elevated serum ca125 then take it with a mesonephric carcinoma adenocarcinoma arising from mesonephric remnant These tumors are not associated with high risk HPV. The rare adenocarcinoma variant, wide age of presentation with mean of about 50 years. These tumors commonly arise in the lateral to posterior cervical wall, may be deeply invasive and bulky or exophytic. These neoplasms may be indolent and have a propensity for late recurrence and metastasis. They are uniformly reactive for cytokeratin and EMA, and often express calatinin, bimentin, and CD10. They are typically negative for estrogen and progesterone receptor and CEA. They may express Pap6, CTF, and CP16 protein. Then these four photomicrographs. The first one shows adenosquamous carcinoma with both glandular and squamous differentiation. Second one is the glossy cell carcinoma with sharp cytoplasmic margins with ground glass eosinophilic cytoplasm. The third is the adenoid basal, and fourth is adenoid cystic carcinoma. Then the neuroendocrine carcinoma, neuroendocrine tumors. Neuroendocrine tumors could be 
the low grade neuroendocrine tumors which are extremely rare the grade 1 which are the typical carcinoid and grade 2 the atypical carcinoid so for carcinoid tumor low grade neuroendocrine tumor grade 1 and for atypical carcinoid low grade neuroendocrine tumor grade 2 High risk HPV 18 can be identified in most cervical neuroendocrine tumors. The presentation may be similar to the other cervical carcinomas, and as you see here, the pattern in the photomicrograph, grade one, the carcinoid having abundant cytoplasm, granular chromatin, and visible to prominent nuclei. and the growth pattern can be organoid, spindle, nested, island, or trabecular. Grade two tumors are distinguished from grade one tumors by greater nuclear atypia and mitotic activity, as well as rare areas of necrosis. I'd say, like the neuroendocrine markers, synaptopyrin, chromogranin, CD56, and NAC. The most frequent allelic loss is localized 3P deletion. Grade one follow an indolent course. Grade two, they are more aggressive. High-grade neuroendocrine carcinoma, they are small cell neuroendocrine, and the high-grade neuroendocrine carcinoma, large cell type. Small cell type, they are aggressive, and they are having small cell morphology with monotonous population of small cells with ovoid hyperchromatic nuclei. With molding and scanty cytoplasm, high-grade neuroendocrine carcinoma of large cell type has a diffuse organoid, trabecular, or cord-like pattern. <coughs> Differential diagnosis includes cervical carcinoma of both squamous and glandular type. <coughs> HPV 18 is identified more frequently than in cervical squamous cell carcinoma. This is the histological features which can be help in uh, identifying the various tumors with the patterns, mitosis, nuclear atypia, neurosecretory granules, and necrosis. So we see here in large cell neuroendocrine, it is moderate the necrosis, but the mitosis is 10 out of 10 hypophyses with marked nuclear atypia. And small cell is extensive necrosis. Mitosis is 10 per 10 hypophyl, but the nuclear atypia is moderate. Neuroendocrine carcinoma, the IHC may provide support, but sometimes they may not express neuroendocrine markers. CTS1 may sometimes come positive. So basically, the morphology helps. And CD56 and synaptopyrin are the more sensitive markers for small cell neuroendocrine carcinoma. Large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma may be P63 positive. Then there are the mesenchymal tumors and tumor-like lesions like leiomyoma, angiosarcoma, embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma, the malignant peripheral nerve-shaped tumors. I have not described them too much of details because they are very rare. Then there are adenosarcomas and malignant melanoma. So, for the neuroendocrine tumor, some questions like typical carcinoids which lack nuclear atypia, mitotic figures, and necrosis. So, necrosis is not a feature of typical carcinoids. And in tunnel clusters, what we see in site A tunnel cluster, it is positive for Pax2, negative P16 and CEA, and KI67 is less than one percent with variable HIK1083. The type A tunnel clusters are positive for Pax2 and negative for P16 and CEA. This is a gastric type of adenocarcinoma in C2. They are characterized by negative or focal staining for P16 with variable KI67 index and focal estrogen receptor staining. And this is second is the HPV-related usual type adenocarcinoma in situ. 
It is characterized by diffuse block like staining for P16, high KI67 index, and negative or focal estrogen receptor expression. So, my references are mostly options such as the Freeman Genetic Tract, WHO book, and the Diagnostic Histopathology of Tumors, the latest fifth edition. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Wonderful. You have covered almost every part of it with the relevant requirements and touched every aspect from in situ to frank tumors to neuroendocrine tumors to mesenchymal tumors. Wonderful lecture. Excellently done. Thank you so much, ma'am. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for the I think you have you have another lecture on Monday, is it? Yes, this is the lecture. Right, right, right. Take care. Thank you so much, man. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. Good night. Take care. Thank you. Bye.